Uh, Noah Charney is joining us from Maine, uh, from the University of Maine, where he's a professor of conservation biology. Uh, he's author of a new book, These Trees Tell a Story. Uh, and he has also co-authored award-winning uh, book, The Tracks and Sign of Insects and Other Invertebrates, A Guide to North American Species. And he's also published scientific articles on forests and climate change and salamanders and all kinds of great stuff. Um, he serves as the executive director of the conservation nonprofit Radnor to River in Nashville, Tennessee. And we're really excited to have him with us here today. Uh, remember, uh, just a quick note, remember to put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, when Noah finishes speaking, Kim Rowe, our Monmouth County chapter leader, will be managing the Q&A for Noah. And now, uh, without uh, further ado, uh, Noah Charney on reading our landscapes in the highlands, uh, what our forests can tell us. Thanks very much for joining us today, Noah. All right, thank you. I'm just gonna get my Zoom screen set up here. I think you can see and hear me now. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start. Um, yeah, so that was a, wow, that was a really a lot, a wonderful presentation we just watched and, and learned a lot about the, pieces and all the species and places in New Jersey. And, and I'm not going to sort of compete with that depth of knowledge of, of the places here. I'm going to take a, a, you know, a slightly different approach um, from afar, thinking about the processes and how to think about landscapes and, and the sorts of things going on in them. And uh, yeah, so I'm talking about the highlands and the Ridge and Valley area. Um, and if we look, let me get my mouse working here. So uh, you should be able to see here in New Jersey and the, the eco regions. Uh, so these highlands and ridge and valley are the de eco regions defined by EPA. And what goes into defining these eco regions is a little bit of the plants, but it's really a lot of the geology, uh, the soils and the land use. Um, like So the highlands is sparsely populated, heavily forested uh, and has a lot of hills. And these valleys uh, in both ridge and valley and highlands that have these nutrient-rich soils from limestone and, and other deposits, where there's a lot of farming that happens, you know, down in those rich soils. Um, and notice that, you know, the highlands were sort of down here in New Jersey, and they go way up, up into northern Maine and beyond the, that ecoregion. And, you know, it's not really the same trees that are in uh in those places. The forests up in Maine are mostly spruce, fir, sort of boreal kind of approaching forests up there. And then down here, it's more of the oak deciduous forest. But, um, and, you know, and same thing with Ridge and Valley, it goes from New Jersey all the way down past Tennessee. And while, you know, the forests are sort of different between them, the sorts of processes and the, and the way the landscapes are put together are kind of very similar. And so I've lived for you know 20 years in Tennessee, six years in Eastern Pennsylvania, 20 years in Western Mass, and now a few years up in Maine. And uh, what I'm gonna do today is share some stories from my time in, in these places. And, and what I've noticed, you know, is that again, like all of these uh, forests are sort of put together and a lot, it's sort of when I walk into a forest, I ask the same sorts of questions and see the same sorts of patterns, even if the species are slightly different. So that's sort of what I'm hoping to share with you today is sort of how to look at these forests and tell some stories from them. All right. See this. All right. So I want to start in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, which, uh, uh, as was mentioned, I run this nonprofit for the last 15 years. And Nashville is a, a one of the largest land area cities in the country. It's got about 250 square miles of closed canopy forest, if I have that right. And uh, we, um, through the, the, the conservation community, we developed this open space plan, which is the, the official policy within the city of Nashville. Uh, it's passed through Metro Council and it maps out our core conservation areas and these corridors linking between them. And I just uh, want to share a little story about the Richland Creek corridor here. I'm going to zoom in on it. This is Richland Creek. And uh, this is this bridge over it is what I call the Nito Bridgeway. Um, and it's I I named it this when I was a kid. My mom used to drive me home from school along this road here. And we I'd have her take this shortcut. You used to be able to drive across this river, right? Uh, across this uh, railroad bridge right here. Um, but the... So this railroad, you can no longer drive across it. They turn this road into a dead end. You can't do it anymore. But you used to be able to drive across the railroad. We'd get to the bridge, 
she'd stop the car and I'd get out and she'd ask me to count how many turtles I could see from the bridge. And there are lots of different turtles there, box turtles, soft shell turtles, uh, uh, map turtles, turtles that are on sort of the list of species of greatest need of conservation these days. It's things we're really trying to protect. There's a lot of plants there too, you know, baroques and dodder and American water will. It's just one of these places that is one of my favorite wildlife and, and plant and nature viewing places ever. So a few years ago, I went to take my kids back to uh, experience the sacred part of my childhood. And I found this sign. It says road closed, no public access. Um, and I'm like, what What do you mean road closed? I, I, this is a public road. And so I did a little bit of digging and it uh, turns out that the year before, uh, the city of Nashville had literally given, given this uh, road away to the abutting landowners, to rich landowners on either side of the road for free. Um, and this went through, you know, three uh, readings of council, five different um, committees. And this was a two-stage process. It played out over two different years, all of these things. And, and you know, apparently nowhere along the way did anybody stop and kind of raise their hand and, and say like, wait a minute, this, uh, this isn't a good idea. This is, uh, you know, a, a, the kind of place that conservationists are fighting tooth and nail to protect and we actually own it. Like, this is like, a, what are we doing? Why are we giving this away? And what I interpreted as is, you know, the decision makers making these decisions, which are fine people, some of them on the board of our nonprofit, they were given maps that look like this. They're just sort of black and white flat maps that sort of have the property ownership and they have the traffic flow. And remember how I told you that road was cut off. It's no longer, a, it's now a dead end road. So it no longer has any value from a traffic flow perspective. So sure, it's a valueless road, give it away. Um, when you look at maps that look like that, that's, that's the decision you come to. What's obviously not mapped on here are the sort of ecological context, the conservation value, the, the species, the plants and animals, and the flow of the environmental pieces. And uh, this is sort of what I'm motivated to give people this awareness of the context, the environmental context around them, and just help and encourage folks to look at maps and think about these things so that when decisions come up, we are deciding from a more informed place. Um, when I was doing my dissertation work uh, in uh, in the Berkshires, actually part of that zone, uh, the Highlands eco region, I went to about five or six hundred vernal pools and ponds, and you know went throughout the the landscape there and um, saw all these cool things like rich New Yorkers summer homes with these crazy sculptures and like cool ponds and places that when I go back to the Berkshires, I really uh, I, I recognize these places. I like a lot of these spots and. The thing is, I don't know where any of them are because the whole time I was navigating to these ponds, I was following my GPS, like driving along with my GPS or going out in the woods, going to 10, 11 ponds a day, never really doing the work of building that map in my head of where things are, not having to like navigate myself, just letting the, the GPS navigate for me. So when I round the corner today and I'm driving around the Berkshires, I recognize something, but I was like, oh, I didn't know that was next to that. I, I don't know where these things are. It's just sort of a, a jumble in my head. And so, you know, these days with artificial intelligence and, you know, seek identifying species for us or chat GPT, writing uh, answers to questions for us and doing all sorts of thought, you know, these are really powerful, amazing, useful, cool, and also very frightening technologies to me because, you know, we hand our thinking minds over to the machines. We're no longer doing that, like, identifying the species in our hand and getting to know it and thinking beyond what the machines tell us. Um, I think we lose things in that process. Um, so my favorite job I ever had was I was teaching at a college and I taught this course I developed for a few years where um, I would take students on a field trip every Friday out for the whole day into the woods or onto, onto the landscape and we would I would give them a puzzle, some mystery that they would be confronted with. And uh, they would have the day to solve that mystery. And they would learn to read the landscapes, to sort of unpack the patterns and, and processes that they saw and, and connect with the landscape. And it was, for me and for them, a really powerful experience. So what do I mean when I say read a landscape? Um, so there are patterns that you can look at, and then you can sort of discover what those patterns mean and tell the stories of them. So for instance, I'll give you a couple patterns. In, in our yard, there are um, 
you'll notice that there are hemlocks all throughout the understory, but there are no hemlocks in the canopy. So this particular pattern tells a story I'll get back to in a, in a second. I'll give you another pattern. If you dig a hole anywhere in our yard, it just keeps going through this nice soft soil as far as you can reach. Um, it's, you know, the soil our garden loves and you can't find any rocks in the soil. There in the yard, there's just no rocks in our yard at all. But if you take a walk up the hill behind our house within about you know 20 seconds, you start passing lots and lots of rocks. There are rocks everywhere. Uh, they're the footprints of the glaciers. Right? So like 200 years ago, the farmers had to haul the rocks out of their field and line their fields with these stone walls to get rid of the rocks. So why aren't there rocks in our yard? Um, well, when the glaciers melted in, in our area, they left behind this glacial lake. And our house must have been below lake level where for thousands of years, layer after layer of sediment built up burying those rocks. And that's where our garden soil comes from. So we sit up on this hillside looking out over that valley and imagining we're still looking over that glacial lake. You know, our house is beachfront property. It's just that the lake has been gone for 10,000 years. So when you look at the rocks, you'll notice there aren't a lot of or the stone walls. There aren't a lot of little tiny small rocks in there, which suggests that this was probably sheep pasture, uh, not uh, not uh, farm fields or, or crop fields. And, you know, I would have done the same thing. I keep the, the crops down in our yard in that nice lake bottom soil. Um, and then keep the sheep up here. Up here, it's this rocky, acidic soil where the like there's lots of pines, um, and there's uh, you know the partridge berries grow up here. And up here, you have that same pattern with the hemlocks all in the understory and no hemlocks in the canopy. And this is, of course, the classic story of forest succession. When the sheep pasture was abandoned, the winged pine seeds flew out across the field, and the Pines grew up straight and tall and they love the sun, but the thing about pines is they can't grow in the shade of their own canopy. Hemlocks, on the other hand, they love the shade, they're slow growing, and they sit down waiting for the pines to die, waiting to turn this into a hemlock forest. And then there's this middle layer of birches next to these cut stumps that tells of, you know, a couple decades ago, someone cut some of the pines making gaps in the canopy where the birches love to grow. So there's all these layers in the forest and the, and the rocks and the soils that sort of tell us about the past. They tell us about the future, where the forest is going. Um, they tell us, you know, where to you know, plant your garden and where to find the partridge berries and bobcats and fishers and salamanders. And, you know, uh, for me, you know, I think if conservationists had this sort of level of, of understanding the world, I think it would help make better decisions. And I also find that it's just a really powerful way to connect with nature and and sort of spiritually meaningful to me to sort of be part of these stories. So this is what I did with that course. Um, and I've turned that course into a book. And that's the book that like just came out this year that I'm really excited to be able to share some of these stories and, and some of these puzzles uh, with everyone. Um, right. And so, yeah, my kids had to bury the phone after we made the video. There they go. So I want to pause for a minute. I've been talking for I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. And I want to give you a puzzle. And I don't know if this is going to work on Zoom here. Uh, but if uh, the puzzle, I'm going to step you through this. Um, I want you to look at this picture. And you can either think in your head, but look for a pattern. What is the pattern that you see that should be explained? So I think that's the first question. You can either think about it. You can write the answers in the Q&A right now, and I'll see if it pops up. You can talk to your neighbor if you're sitting on the couch with someone else. But take a few seconds to just come up with what pattern is something that, that what puzzle do you see? And yeah, I'll, I'm going to look in the Q&A. I don't know if I'll see them come up because I'm not sure exactly how it works, but what pattern do you see there? So I'm going to add a little bit of a little more detail as you continue to think through this puzzle. Again, this works better, you know, when we're in the same room and we can talk through things. But I see people's answers coming up, which is really helpful and guiding us. Um, yeah, so keep looking here and, and see the pattern. And I see people saying, yeah, it looks like there's a difference between the left and the right, right? The plants are dark green over here and light green over here. And in fact, they're very different species on one side than the other. So that's a pattern. Great. So now the next question is, what process 
could cause that pattern? What do you think is going on? So see if you can write in there or think in your head about what, what you think would cause that pattern. Any sorts of things you can think of that would cause the plants to be different. All right, so, yeah, I am seeing some, yeah, yeah. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and add, I see some people talking about, I'm gonna add one more piece here and see if you can now, I see the word sun and exposure and now try to, I've added, I've changed the species pictures to their names and where they like to live. So now type in there or think like, okay, let's articulate what exactly is happening, explain why, those things are on one side or the other, given this sun and exposure idea that I see popping up. So why, yeah, so there's a, so I see people the south facing slope and, and why, why does that, what does that do to the plants? So I'm going to I'm going to step through this now that I see a lot of answers in here. Um, so when we look at this, right, you know, if you're a south facing slope. You know, in the northern hemisphere, the sun is in the south, southern part of the sky always. Right. That's you know, or above the tropics. So the sun's always in the south. So if you're a south facing slope, uh, you're going to get a lot more sun, which is going to heat you up and dry you out. Right. If you're a north facing slope, it's going to be cool and shady. So you'll be in moisture conditions there. Right. And when we look at this picture, here's the compass and there's north. So that means this is a south facing slope facing the sun. So, and you look at the, what species live here. We've got these, wait, we have, so this has the moist species on the sun side and over here, the dry species. Do I have this backwards? Something looks wrong here, right? This is all mixed up. The, the, this should be the dry species on it. This isn't right. So this isn't right. It must not be that. It, it's something else. What, what other patterns could it be? What other sorts of things? It's not the sun, right? Because it's exactly the opposite pattern of what we'd expect, which is the dry species are on the wet side. So what other sorts of things can drive plant patterns? Yeah, soil. So I see people saying soil. So what is it? Where, where does soil come from? Soil comes from, well, two places. It's sort of vegetation that is er eroded or um, decomposing, losing my words here, and the plants decomposing. And then we have rocks that are weathering, right? And it, up here, we're out, sort of up on a hill, you know, up a mountain. And so it's a more of an er erosional environment. So there's, the soil tends to get washed away. So you're actually a lot of contact with the bedrock. It's a very bedrock dr driven soil here. So yeah. Let's now look at that bedrock. Okay, so and, and anybody recognize any of these two rocks here on either side? And if you do, type them in, that'd be great. Um, I'll point out this one over here. Hopefully you guys can see my mouse and all this and I'm not just uh, talking without you knowing where I'm pointing. But over here, there are these pebbles in here. This kind of looks like con concrete, doesn't it? And this is a conglomerate rock. Uh, it's actually, it's sort of a, it's a arcosic conglomerate that, that uh, sort of, between a conglomerate and a sandstone, it sort of fades in from one to the other at this site. And then over here, I see people saying uh, basalt, these sharp edges. It should look a lot like rocks you get, you know, on the Huachang Mountains and such. Um, basalt is an ancient lava flow, right? So we know how North America keeps bumping into other continents. The last time North America and Africa went to separate, uh, all these little stretch marks formed as the continent, the plates were moving apart. And into these stretch marks, sort of the valleys opened up and lava bubbled up. And you had these like 800 foot deep lava lakes uh, that then cooled and formed basalt. And then there was some more, uh, more mountain processes and, and sedimentary layers fell on top of that. And then you had another rifting and more lava. So you had these layers of basalt and sedimentary basalt that, that stacked up like that. And then you know, eventually the Atlantic op Ocean opened up, but not where where this 
rift valley was. This rift valley was aborted and the real rift valley was just east of our coast where it is right now. That's the one that won, right? East of New Jersey and the whole Atlantic coastline. So there are all these aborted rift valleys that didn't become the Atlantic Ocean all the way from you know, North Carolina up to Massachusetts and beyond where you have these basalt formations. And so there are these layers of sedimentary and basalt uh, and then they got tilted with plate tectonics and then the, the erosion of the rain and such sort of wore them away. But basalt is more resistant to weathering. So um, it stuck out as these mountains. Uh, and with these, when here you see this edge between the basalt and, and the uh, conglomerate sort of stuck like this. And this is how, you know, where the Wachung Mountains and other mountains came from uh, up and down the, the, through these rift valleys. And it just so happens that Basalt gives a lot of magnesium and nutrients to the soil, as opposed to the, the archosic uh, conglomerate on the other side, which doesn't. And usually, you know, I think of rich sites, which are sites with lots of nutrients given by the basalt in this case. I think of rich, loving plants as also those plants that like moisture in a lot of cases, because lowlands tend to be where the nutrients are washed away towards. There tends to be more when there's more water, you have more nutrient availability. So I often think of plants as like rich and moist loving. And then another lot of plants, when they're up in the hilltops, it's dry and it's more acidic, nutrient poor, the nutrients are washed away. So I think of rich and moist kind of together and, and warm, dry, poor, acidic as sort of together often. I mean, I know with the bogs and, and peatlands kind of flip that a little bit. But in this case, we've sort of decoupled those two things. And it's not the moisture preferences that's driving the plants here. It's the, the nutrient so richness preferences in the soils that's driving the differences here. So we can see that sort of story of the continental uh, movement and lava flows from millions of years ago in the plant associations right next to each other at this site. So when I think about a, a place, um, a forest. There is a number of layers of things that I think about. Uh, I think about the bedrock, um, the surficial deposits, um, like glaciers, something like glacial deposits, particularly here. On top of that, you know, the topographic position. Where on a landscape are you? This is what, um, then the landscape context. What's around you? Disturbance history. What's happened in the past? What's the last thing that sort of change that site. And then the values that we bring to a site. These are all the kinds of things I think about when I walk into a, in a forest and I kind of want to tell the story of that site and understand how I think about it. So I'm going to walk the rest of this talk. I'm going to walk through these processes. I'm going to spend a little more time on some than the other, um, but just to sort of walk through how, how we think about things. So we've talked a little bit about bedrock. You have this stack of uh, all these different layers that were put down. Plate tectonics comes along and tilts them. And then the rain comes along and weathers them and different rock layers weather differentially. So limestone, for instance, weathers really quickly, whereas the granite and quartzite, they weather more slowly. Through, so they stick up like mountains. And now this is, if you were on the surface in New Jersey, this is kind of like a cartoonish depiction of what it's like, right? There's like the highlands over here, the granite. Um, you've got Kittitini and, and you know, the Shangunks, the, the quartzite that stick up over there. And in between, you have these limestone and um, sedimentary rich uh, valleys that make for that great, those great crops and, and sort of uh, rich farmland kind of places. Now, I will say that that's sufficient on the surface is kind of like that. What I've drawn underneath is completely wrong because the geology is way more complex. It's not just simply stacked and tilted. It's folded and thrusted, and it's just a complex maze underneath. Um, the landscape there. But, you know, from a sort of uh, cartoony kind of sense of the kinds of processes, this is sort of what it's like in, in North Jersey. Um, so then, you know, the rain falls and, and uh, the water makes these drainage networks that it cuts through the hills and makes some of the creeks come together, make bigger, bigger lakes or, or uh, rivers that go out to the ocean. Um, but then, you know, along come glaciers and they dump glacial till, unsorted piles of random rubble and all across the landscape. And that does two things. First thing it does is it masks the best, the bedrock influence. So in the glaciated north, um, you usually have this giant layer of till in between the bedrock and the soils. So you don't see those kind of really fine scale influence of bedrock on the plant communities like I just showed you very often in places where there's been glaciers uh, because there's this buffer in between them. 
Now, over larger scales, yeah, you'll see that like in, in sort of rich areas that, uh, where the bedrock's rich, you'll get sort of rich associations, but not over these really fine scale, like here's a bedrock division and you can see the plants shift. That's rare in glaciated landscapes. The other thing that the till does is see how it's uh, it stopped up all those drainage networks and made the water pool in these puddles. Um, and so, you know, you end up with a lot of vernal pools and and ponds and, and and standing water because the networks of drainage have been plugged up. You know, I grew up in Tennessee where, um, you know, it's what, it's like 800 mile wide state or something like that. And there's not a single lake that is natural in the entire state. And it's a statistic we like to brag about, except, well, there is one lake, um, Real Foot Lake in the 1815 or so, the, the or 1812, the, the New Madrid earthquake made the Mississippi River flow backwards for a day or two into this new lake. But largely, there's really no natural lakes in, in the state. And that's in large part because water has had so long to create these drainage networks and glaciers have never come along and messed them up. So they just, the landscape drains very efficiently. So the glacial deposits influence your forest or your landscape. Um, the next thing we're talking about is topographic position, right? Where are you on a topo map? If you're up at the top of the hill, your roots are gonna be far from the water table generally. So you're gonna wanna be something like a chestnut oak or something that likes these drier soils or can reach way down to get water. And then if you're down or as the further you go down a hill, the closer you are to the water table generally. So then you get into, you know, your sycamores and sweet gums and other plants that kind of like more wet roots or, or can handle or can't handle the, the sort of dry conditions at the top. Uh, the other thing, you know, as we talked about aspect, which direction does your hill face? Uh, so here up on Kittatinny, here's the Appalachian Trail. You can see this ridge line and the south slope is these, these nice hardwood forests that are sunny and open. And then on the north facing slope, it's the hemlocks and pines. It's these evergreen forests, real clear uh, aspect driven distinction between the forest types. The other thing I mentioned was landscape context. Um, so here's a shot of um, Toaco, uh, just north of Morristown here. You look, and obviously this is a fragmented landscape, right? You know, it's there's houses everywhere, but there are some forest remnants. And and when you look in the middle of those forest remnant patches, you see that it's it's a hardwood forest, right? It, it, it's you can see this is a winter photo or spring, early spring photo. But when you look around the edges, notice how there's green around this field here, green along the house lines. Um, this green, I think, is mostly invasive species, you know, honeysuckle and, and privet and, and other things that tend to leaf out early and hold their leaves later on. So you can actually see them from the aerial photos. So there, where you are and what's happening in your forest really depends on the context, you know, what's around you, right? So when you're near the edge, there's a source of seeds from invasives. There's more sunlight. There's more, you know, birds pooping out seeds often and, and uh, you know, the it dries out the forest interior. And so the further you get away from the edge, the further from those factors. And when you get into the interior forests, when you have a less invaded, a more intact forest that has a really different feel to it. So you can really see that on just from, from space. All right, um, the next thing, I wanna talk about disturbance history for a while here. Uh, and I'll start with this little story from, from far away. Uh, when uh, in grad school, my wife and I were working on this plant here, Furbish's last word. It's one of the first six plants listed under the Federal Endangered Species Act. It stopped this giant dam project back in the 70s. This cool plant grows along the St. John River on the border of Canada and the U.S. And we were going to actually find these plots that people had, uh, Sue Goller had planted, put toothpicks in individual plants 30 years prior to this. Uh, and was she was you know, tracking individual plant growth, trying to make a population model, like as plants grow and this and they create salad, uh, flowers and seeds and there's re-sprouting, parameterizing all the parts of that population growth to, to sort of project forward how that population will grow. Now we were down there trying to find her toothpicks and rediscover her plants and uh, little plots from 30 years prior, crawling around on the, you know, we'd park this, this rental pickup on the side border of the US and Canada and we're crawling around by the river and of course, Border Patrol uh, 
thought we were up to no good um, and came down and and my wife swears that they came down with their guns like drawn. I don't remember that, but I do remember her screaming at them, don't step on the plants uh, and them not really understanding what we were talking about and what plants we were talking about. Um, so anyway, we got out of that situation and we uh, we also at the same time we were doing something similar with uh, Calicorus, uh, Tiburon and other Mariposa lilies out in California. Again, going back and finding plots from 30 years prior. The goal was to try to understand how these population models do at sort of projecting forward the growth of these plants. So we found the toothpicks and things that were there 30 years ago. Metal detectors help. We also found some like Civil War era bullets out there. And uh, we found some of the plots. But we also found was that, you know, a lot of these places had changed, right? In California, poison oak had totally changed the habitat, had taken over some of these plots, and you know it just wasn't the same place. Up on the St. John River, there were things like giant ice jams that had like taken out whole sections of the riverbank. And the point of these stories is that, you know, the population models of like what an individual plant is doing, isn't really going to determine the future of that plant population. What determines the future? is how the habitat and the world around it changes. The major disturbances that change or what, what that place is. It's sort of not up to the, the plants themselves. It's up to the, the greater world is sort of how we think about that. And so New Jersey and all of the East is always is, is really not in a static condition, just like those populations we visited. They are, it is a dynamic place. It is changing. It, is, it has been changing for a very long time. And we can think about that change on a few different scales. We can start with the glacial time scales, right? 21,000 years ago, there was a giant glacier, glacial ice sheet over, you can see my mouse here, just north of this line, this was where the ice sheet was. Um, so there was a was mile thick ice sheet, right? And then as time went on, uh, the ice sheet retreated and these, you'll watch the plant communities move north with that. So in first came taiga and then, uh, you know, thousands of years went by and eventually we got through to the cool mixed forest in this place. Uh, and then uh, uh, to 10,000, 9,000, all the way to like, I think it was about 3,000 years ago that the temperate deciduous forest finally moved in here. And so that will bring you through all the way to modern times is what, what it looks like today. So there was shift over you know, last thousands of years and the plants and the species are still responding to that retreating glacier. There's still mo mo northward movement of species, and we are not in a static place over that sort of time frame yet. Um, and, you know, the movement of those species, you know, we think about today pines and oak sort of associations, but back at the peak glaciation, the oaks were down here along the Gulf Coast and the pines and hemlocks were up on the East Coast. They, they weren't even in the same places. So these associations of plants is sort of a new thing. The plants each went their, their separate ways across the continent, sort of following the glaciers. And now today we have the associations have, as we have them. And if we think forward in climate change terms, this is a paper I wrote looking at tree rings. Uh, and it looks like with climate change, we're going to have more droughty conditions, and that that's going to cause trees, on average, not even thinking about the extreme scenarios, just on average, trees will be growing more slowly across most of the continent, including in New Jersey. So let's think about a slightly shorter time scale of change. Since European arrival um, in 1600, when, when, when folks arrived here from Europe, there, New Jersey was pretty much all forested. And very quickly, uh, farming and um, logging for the for purpose of making charcoal to smelt iron uh, took over, and we cleared out the forest by you know mid 1800s. Very few forests were left, and in, in this farming and and iron and, and sort of logging, even up in the top in the highlands and in the uh, region valley, was really extensive. And this is really true across all of the eastern U.S. Um, and then we ran out of wood. We ran out of uh, timber to heat our, to smelt the iron, to heat our homes. And so these industries were abandoned. Folks moved farming out west where there was richer soils. And as these industries were abandoned, the forest began to grow back. And largely the last 150 years across all of the Northeast is this story of forest regeneration. Places that once were cleared, now having forest again. Um, a little bit of forest cutting in the last few decades again, but largely the forest distribution is is back kind of like you know i'm 
not not like not everywhere, but all across a lot of the landscape. But what ha hasn't rebounded is the sort of successional stages, the forest itself, even in the places where there's forest. Remember these successional stages I talked about before, they take, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years to work through, right? You might start out with a tulip poplar or, um, seedlings, or I talked about those pine seedlings, the seeds disperse across the field and they make this tulip poplar forest, but this is, you know, the first wave of succession. And uh, it's only, you know, 100 years later, whatever, that, you know, the beech nuts, that beech nuts have to be planted individually by blue jays or squirrels who forget about them and then they grow. Uh, and the beeches then grow in the understory and wait for those, you know, 200 years or whatever for the to take over and turn it into perhaps a beech forest. And so, you know, four or five hundred years to get to the depending on how many stages of succession you have to go through to get to an old forest. And we are we're only 150 years old. We're 150 years into this process. Right. So we're nowhere near approaching like old forests. Um, and so even in a, you know, here's an old growth beech forest, uh, even in these systems, uh, you know, you have some of the early successional species like this tulip poplar, and, and how do they get there? Well, in an old forest, the trees fall over, as was mentioned earlier, uh, the, and they, the tip-up mounds have this nice fresh soil, which is really important for regeneration for a lot of species like black birch and um, other species, you know, northern white cedar up in, in Maine and, and other, and and uh, tulip poplar in this case, uh, those mounds, the dirt sort of wears away into these mounds. So you see these hummocks in the forest. Um, but in this is an old tulip poplar in this old growth forest. And you can see this sort of buttress like octopus root shape suggests that this grew on a tip up mound hundreds of years ago. Um, so we're talking about disturbances still, you know, like what's happened to this forest in the past. And in these early successional forests, uh, Early successional forests tend to have more light into them. The trees grow faster and ha have more spacing. So they tend to be sunnier places, which is better habitat for invasives um, because they they like the, the sunny understory there. So you see just, uh, early successional forests as heavily invaded typically. Um, other sorts of disturbance that you can see when you look at uh, uh, trees like this, you can see that this these oaks were logged in the past. Um, the oaks usually grow as a single trunk, a single stem, but where they are cut down, they stump sprout and you get these multiple forked stem trunks that sort of grow back again. So there's a place I like to take my students to where, you know, on one side you have this pitch pine forest and on the other side, it's this oak forest, um, a scarlet oak, and, and uh, it's just right next to each other. And what's driving this is when you look, if you do a soil core, you can see that one side has these nice soil horizons um, and the other it's all mixed up so this was plowed and the communities are really different on the, the plowed side you know it's got your kind of mayflower and the haircap moss and then on the other side you've got winter green and, and then uh sort of a uh, the dwarf chestnut oak um and so it's really driven by that land use history and often you'll you'll see if if uh if a place was sheep pasture or had livestock on it, the junipers, the, the red cedars will be dominant at first because those are the things that resist being eaten and they'll be sort of the first part of the forest and you'll see their old, the old dead ones in the understory. So those herbivores, they drive sort of a lot of the successional stages like the voles, their taste in which trees they eat, which trees they don't eat can decide how the forest, what it's going to turn into. Uh, you know, there's this one place that I, I like to take my students where it's all this sort of ag agricultural uh, farm, but it was abandoned around the same time. And one part of it turned into this aspen forest. And right nearby, the other part turned into this tangled thicket of multiflora, rose, privet, bittersweet. Um, and uh, they're right next to each other. And the difference is the aspen was a farm field that was open. And so the, the seeds blew across it and the, the trees sort of grew up. Over here, it was more of the orchard area. So there were already some source of like rows in the corners and some birds pooping out seeds. And so there was source of invasives was already there and they kind of grew out and sort of took over and made a very different pathway of succession. So I'm moving on to values here, how we think about these places. And you know, I, we rail against invasive species and they definitely like, as we saw in the previous talk, you know, to sort of wreck forests. Um, but I, I'm one who says that, you know, a species isn't isn't really all bad. It's maybe the native thing would be better, but 
there is some value, like particularly in places where what's the alternative? This is already a sort of a, a messed up system and it's totally covered in these invasives, these thickets, but I happen to love this invasive thicket uh, in part because, you know, it's got a ton of wildlife. The bobcats love this thicket. It's the largest population of our densest population of bobcats I've ever seen is in this place. So it's it's and the birds eat the berries in the winter. So there is some value. It's not like they're just trash, completely worthless species. So even in these entangled thickets of invasives, you get you get things that are pretty and support other species, and and there's there is value in it. I think so. You know, my yard, as uh, you might imagine, so when we moved in, it looked like this. This is our yard. This is our yard. This is our neighbors. We turned it into a wild yard with these pads we mowed for our children to walk through the golden rod. And I love it. You know, the the sumac the has the pollen solitary bees that nest in the stems that are all broken and all over the place. And we've got uh, fireflies and all sorts of things that endangered snakes and foxes and bobcats and I love our yard there. Um, and it's also, you know, not all natives. In fact, a lot of what you'd expect to come up are things like, you know, evening primrose, butter and eggs, mall and so forth, all these European uh, escaped species that, again, I think have value in this context. They're providing structure for wildlife. They're pretty, they're they're fun, and I enjoy them. It'd be better if they're natives, but I, I find value in the non-natives too. Um, and, you know, I... I enjoy all the leaf miner insects that that live in our in our tangled mess there, and I don't. We don't sort of rake our leaves and burn them or trash or throw them to the dump because, uh, you, as you probably know, that's where the the pollinators overwinter in the leaf litter, and so we leave them on site to keep the pollinators around and all the other creatures that live in them. And you know, we do try to put in as many natives as we can because there's you know it's been shown Desiree Narango did this work where in and neighborhoods that had lots of non-native shrubs, uh, the there weren't enough bugs because the bugs eat the native plants more than the non-native. And so the chickadee mamas couldn't find enough bugs to feed their babies and the babies all starved to death. So, you know, in, in our backyard up that hillside, there is these old growth hemlock forests that were, uh, that escaped logging because they're on such steep slopes. And I just, I love these old forests. They're just pretty to me. and and. They have these hummocky uh, old tip-up mounds on that support, you know, regeneration, as we talked about. The, in the pits, you'll get breeding frogs and overwintering turtles and snakes. And a lot of people look at a forest that is, you know, falling apart and trees all over the ground and coarse weed debris and say, it's a mess. This forest is unhealthy. It needs to get cleaned up. But I look at this and I'm like, this is exactly how it should be. This is a forest that is giving life to new generations of plants and salamanders and all sorts of wildlife. So I am one to say, keep the forest messy and let it be. So those are my values that I, I bring to all these different layers of how I look at the landscape. And I'm going to do one last thing. Um, well, two last things. First, I want to take you on one more walk up the hill behind the house where I grew up. Um, this uh, hill had these old... Uh, tulip poplar that I thought of as a kid as like these giant uh, immutable like ancient trees um but now looking back I understand that they were really just growing up alongside me too this was a former fox hunting ground this is an early successional forest uh and you can see that the next generation of beaches is coming up under it and down you know uh in our down right behind my house it's a limestone layer just like we've talked about limestone down in the valleys in, in North Jersey. Um, and that creates these rich soils with a lot of plants like bladder nut, American bladder nut, and, uh, and toothwort, trout lily, ginseng, um, and spice bush. And down at the bottom, you know, this is near the road, near the houses, you're at these edges and you can see that green versus that brown there. And that's, you know, of course, that uh, those invasive species right on the edge, as I mentioned before, this is sort of a perfect storm. We've got a confluence of they're near the edge, right? Uh, this is an early successional forest. There's this rich limestone that creates the soils that, that invasives love. Um, and it's near water. Another thing that, you know, privet, honeysuckle, creeping euonymus, all these things love uh, these kinds of systems. And so it's just, there's a, a big invasive problem there. 
But as you move up the hill, you go from this limestone to the more uh, acidic rock on the top. And you get into areas with you know greenbrier and deerberry and azalea, uh, and this the top is this chestnut oak. It's actually an ancient old growth forest here with three hundred year old trees uh, that was protected again because it's up high and hard to access. And old growth trees get this awesome structure where they're they're like gnarly and twisted and thick barked, uh, and and the the stems are sort of a little bit short. I mean the branches are a little bit short. Um, it's just a a cool spot there. And I don't know if anyone's ever seen this, but the, the bases of the trees have these circles of rocks around them. I think from where as the hill erodes away, the, the trees kind of hold these rocks in place. And my favorite part about these like acidic sort of rich, uh, or, 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 or the acidic sort of dry hilltop chestnut oak kind of places are, is the crane fly orchid, tipularia discolor that you find up there. And I just love the, you know, the green surface of leaf and you flip it over and this awesome purple color on these orchids. So I'm going to end with uh, a little reading from my book, just a couple paragraphs. Uh, you know, books about nature, it's also about life, and there's a lot of metaphors in here. And I want to just talk about, uh, I'm going to read this one paragraph from the chapter that uh, when we're going up to that that first puzzle we solved, where the, the two different slopes facing each other, I'm in this section, I'm uh, carrying my son on my back, walking uh, uphill on this trail. And we decide to cut off the trail because following the trail is the easiest way to be lost. Sure, that trail might take us to a preordained destination faster, but we'll have no idea where we are when we get there. While we're on the trail, we lose track of what's around us and where we are in space. We are lost. We put our trust in the trail, ceding responsibility. We give up our awareness, our senses, our minds, our interface with the landscape boils down to just two numbers, the uh, total length of the trail and the distance that we've traveled. But staring at the path a few feet in front of us, we're not fully engaged with the surrounding world. But if you step off that path, um, suddenly we have to look up, look at the shape of the land and decide how steeply we want to climb. Look at the trees in the distance and pick a target to walk toward. Keep looking behind so that we'll recognize the forest when we encounter it from the other direction. Uh, study the shrub layer for gaps to duck through. Following the occasional animal trails worn through the denser areas, use the network of deer paths when traversing steep slopes to gain level footing. Keep an eye out for poison ivy, rose thorns, and ticks waving their arms, hoping to catch a ride. Study the patterns of light for clearings. Monitor the changing habitats near and far. Uh, white tops of sycamores in the distance signaling a creek. Chestnut oaks nearby telling us we've reached the drier hilltops. The banjo like limp of a lone green frog calling from the wetland ahead that we hope to steer around. Keep an eye on the rising sun and remember where south is as we walk. This whole time, we maintain a map of the landscape in our heads, filling in the details as we go. That is how we get to know the world and our place in it. So thank you. And with that, I will stop and answer any more questions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can see you. There we go. No, I just want to say thank you so much. This is Kim. And uh, that was a fantastic presentation. I really enjoyed it, as I'm sure all of us did. And um, we've been sort of summarizing some of the questions. So maybe I can help you out with that a little bit. Sure. Uh, first of all, I just want to say, can't wait. I haven't had a chance to read your book yet, but I cannot wait. And I'm sure that everyone on here feels the same way. Okay. Um, the one thing that jumped out uh, before we jump into the questions here is uh, the, the 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 story you started out with about uh, in Tennessee, the road that yeah. was lost and given away. So many of us here are involved on a local level with our environmental commissions, and we have the opportunity to review plans. Um, what are some of the steps we should take to avoid a situation like that? Well, there's a few different things that, you know, we've been pushing for. Um, and, well, w one of them is having the maps really good and accessible and used in all the decisions that, like, map out these areas and making sure you have good maps that are in front of the decision makers and are part of that process. Part of it is, like, making sure there's, you know, 
I'm not sure what level you're talking about, but at some at, on each decision and what we've been pushing for in you know, the planning department is having a staff person on, you know, someone on staff whose job is it to like make sure that, you know, not just with like the environmental review and all the box checking that you have to do to jump through the hoops, like that stuff is, you know, you, Army Corps of Engineer, that's always going to get done. But that none of that really has that broad level thinking of what you need of like someone to make sure those sort of low level decisions are the things that don't meet don't have to go through review actually still conform with the essence of like conservation that you want to see happen so having a staff person whose job is conservation focused is i think really important um and yeah everything you can do to sort of get to know your local landscapes and be involved and advocate for folks understanding what's around and what the important parts of it are i think those are some of the, the things that jump to mind i don't know if you have more questions on that but no, that was a great answer. Thank you. Um, some of the folks were asking about the tip-up mounds, and they were yeah. intrigued by that. Um, can you tell us more about uh, about those? Yeah. So basically, when a tree when a tree falls over, if it's still very much alive, and so if a tree falls over after it's long dead, it actually doesn't make much of a tip-up mound because its roots are kind of all not very good but when it falls over when it's got a lot of root mass and it it pulls up those roots it pulls up all the dirt with those roots as it falls over and it sort of pull makes this hole and and next to this ball where the tip of the root ball is and over time that sort of the weathers away and decomposes but you still have this mound of dirt that you can see centuries later and this little pit next to it and that pit, you know, I, the wood frogs and all sorts of things breed in, in those pits and with turtles and salamanders and snakes overwinter them. And then the the mound, um, yeah, like I said, that fresh dirt is a, is a great place for seed seeds to germinate that can't germinate in le thick leaf litter or um, really needs direct contact with soil. So I think of black birch, and but there's other species too. And, and uh, Audrey Bar Barker Plotkin up at Harvard Forest, they did this experiment with, they simulated a hurricane and took down all these trees and then they're uh, surveying vegetation on tip up mounds versus like on flats and, and pits and found that like there's a whole set of trees, species and plants that only grew on the tip up mounds because that's the only place they could get that the soil and also get up above the sort of the rest of the, the, the ferns and things in the understory and actually get light. Um, and so it's a really important part of the structure of, of a forest um, and it, uh, yeah. And then it, you, you'll you see that, that the hummocky floor of, a, of an old growth forest in certain cases, uh, you can see all those old tip up mounds. And then it's sort of the similar idea with nurse logs, which I'm sure folks are familiar with, like the, the tree itself, the bull rots away and, and that's where a lot of seedlings and, and such will grow. Um, same kind of idea with the, the ball itself of dirt. I know I'll be looking out for them when I'm in the forest. Yeah. So we had some questions about um, about suburbia, <clears throat> you know, in New Jersey, lots of us live in places where um, we don't get to walk out the back door to see the forest. So can you name, <clears throat> excuse me, two or three things that we can look for in a very um, degraded atmosphere like or environment like uh, like suburbia, where we're very overdeveloped? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot that happens. I mean, there's so much to look at. I'm sort of like, where where do you want to start? But like, you know, <laughs> I, I and one of my favorite things is I I like to see like succession in, in old parking lots. <laughs> um, you can see like the little moss and the, the sort of blocks and other things starting to make succession out of the asphalt where things have been abandoned and and kind of watch that process happening. I I find that uh, nice. I you know in and as I said in these tangled thickets of invasives that we think are horrible. I mean look for this, the bobcats and the other wildlife that are making use of them. And, and you'll find that they're really dense with certain suites of, of wildlife species and, and other things. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that I often look at too, you know, in the, it, uh, sometimes like you'll see trees that are wetland trees, there'd be like a bike path and, and, and there's like, you know, these wetlands, uh, swamp white oaks or, or, silver maples or something and you're like but this is just like a regular bike pathy kind of place and it'll be a clue that like well this probably was a wetland this probably was like a vernal pool before we paved this over and you can kind of see some of these relics of like 
the trees and the things that are still hanging on there, they're kind of telling you what that site would have been a hundred years ago before we paved it over. You can definitely find some of those clues in, in looking, thinking about the plant uh, associations, um, especially the trees and things that, that you'll see in different parts of your neighborhood. Um, so yeah, I think um, there's a lot, of, a lot of different layers to look at and, and things to think about. Those are a couple of them. That's great, thank you. Um, another person is asking about suburbia, logging, municipal, municipal land use, how do all of those things, all those disturbances affect forest regeneration in the areas that it, where it can regenerate in New Jersey, particularly? Um, well, so, yeah, I mean, there's uh, all different pathways of, of regeneration. I mean, so, you know, if you're, it depends what we're talking about. Like, oh, is it selective logging or is it like clear cutting and like what, uh, uh, certainly like you can have, like the, all sorts of things can re reduce regeneration of seedlings, right? Um, the, the deer in suburbia, right? And the, and trampling. Um, I guess, you know, it's, I guess I wonder what regeneration means as part of where I'm struggling here too, because the forest, as I said, like they're still, they haven't even finished growing these old forests, right? They're like still going through the process of growing up. And uh, so, cutting them down now it's like what do we want them to regenerate to like we want to start over at early successional species or we want to sort of move them forward to the next stage um yeah and i i think there's so many there's so many different factors that come into play there you know with the you know garlic mustard or whatever you know suppressing growth and the understory with its you know, and on other things but yeah Sounds like we need a PhD too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To answer that question, right? That's a challenging one. Mm -hmm. um, all right, let's see what else we have. Uh, someone's asking about beech trees in Tennessee. Uh, is the beech leaf disease a problem for you? So the beech is over on I don't. I know there's a few different diseases, the scale disease, the beech leaf disease. And as, as far as I've seen, um, the Southern beaches just are doing way better, like have been over the last few decades. I don't know about them in the last few years, but I haven't seen any evidence of real beach die off yet in right where I am. Not, not to say other folks haven't, because I haven't been studying that, but but I do notice like when I'm in the North, like beach trees like horrible and they're just so blighted and, and scale and, and and barely grow, um, although they do colonially reproduce. Um, but down there, you know, you get a lot of big beaches that seem to be doing fine and don't have uh, all of that. And I'm not sure exactly what that is, if it's the temperatures or that there's just, you know, often, you know, southern climates will have more com competing uh, insects that can help sort of alleviate some of the in invasive ones and kind of like clear them out a little bit. So um, that's been my experience, not to say that's the broad consensus of what's happening. So, yeah. All right. Um... I think it, this might be our last question. Uh, can you distill down your advice for folks who are trying to learn how to read the landscape uh, to two or three big points, things that we should start with or that you would help uh, students start with to read the landscape better? Well, yeah, I mean, what I usually look at is let's, let's start in a forest. Um, if, if you can get yourself into some sort of forest, uh, closed forest. And I, the first thing I would look at is like the, the vertical layering. Like, can you name the species of the canopy? And can you name the species of trees in the understory? And are those species the same? Or do you see like differences? And if they're different, that tells you that if you wait a little bit, a hundred years or two, um, that there's going to be a different canopy in the future. And so that tells you that it's still going through successional changes. Um, so that's one, you know, one easy thing I often look at. And you'll get those little clues like the split trunk trees on hardwoods that, that'll tell you um, that they're going through succession. And the other thing I like to do too is pull up a ge geologic map and look at where you are. Are you where relative to that glacial moraine where the last the glacier came down? Are you below or above that? What is the bedrock where you are? Um, and just get to know that those geologic maps and specifically where you're at, because there's there's online so many great resources these days for GIS to like go in and, and see the geology. And the other thing I always do is always look at Google Maps, look at Google Earth and look at that forest from above and see 
what's around it? What is, where are you? And and those are some of those places, like, like I always start when I go into place, like, is there vertical structure? Like, what, where am I on a map? And, um, and those are just some of the, some of the easy things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you, do you start by, um, uh, is one place you, to start sort of taking an inventory, looking for uh, what you see out there? Yeah, so sure. And and this is the the teaching that I, I brought that course came from UVM, developed this idea that actually Tom Sigma at Yale. But basically there's like the pieces, the pattern, and the process, right? So first, what are the pieces? Name the species or the rocks. And just like make a list, like you said, an inventory. How many of these pieces can you name? Can you name? And then look for the pattern. Like, is there a vertical pattern? Is there a left-right pattern? Or is this place different from that place over there? After you've named the pieces, how are they arranged? And then you can start to discover, okay, what's the underlying process? What formed this? Why is this happening? So those that's sort of the order conceptually. That's great. Well, thank you again, Noah. This was a, a really terrific. Yeah, uh, so this was a lot of fun. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, I want to uh, 